observe. This is the first step in the scientific process. Sharpen and hone your observational skills. What is going on in the world around you? Note everything you see and experience. Hashtag Mr. Neely's Scientific Adventure. September 5th, Assignment 1, Observe Your Surroundings. Mr. Neely just wrote our first lab book assignment on the board in his scrunched up, scratchy handwriting, and he's getting all excited about this scientific process stuff. I'm not sure why he feels the need to use hashtags and spell perfectly innocent words with a Z, but he's one of those teachers you don't bother questioning. He has big plans for this lab notebook. Apparently, he thinks it's important to teach, teach students dedication to long-term projects. And this assignment is his grand solution. Basically, we're supposed to observe something that interests us and spend all year applying the scientific process to our capital Q question. As soon as we sat down, he passed out these dorky old composition notebooks and said, this will be your wonderings journal. You will record lab notes and assignments and document the greatest scientific journey of all time, your scientific journey. We all stared trying to figure out if he was for real or not. He was. You'll spend this year developing your own scientific process. And it all starts with one question, that thing that sparks you to life. Mr. Neely made a weird explosion gesture with his hands, and someone in the back of the room giggled, which only seemed to encourage him. By the end of the year, I'll be the one learning from you. Mr. Neely is a new teacher, so he's still all optimistic and stuff. But personally, I think this assignment's a lost cause. Last year, our English teacher, Mrs. Jackson, thought it'd be really great for us to keep journals. The only requirement, 50 pages by the end of the year, written from the heart. If you haven't guessed already, that just resulted in everyone writing all 50 pages the day before the journals were due. I mostly filled mine with song lyrics, copied my biggest, sloppiest handwriting, and technically, this is supposed to be homework, but I don't see why I shouldn't get a head start. Without further ado, dearest lab notebook, I present Natalie Napoli's scientific observations. Mr. Neely waves his arm in big circles when he talks, which makes him look like an over-eager hula dancer. His white button down bright against his dark brown skin wrinkles as he moves. He tells us he wants us to embrace the joys of science. Michaela Menzer raises her hand. Michaela Menzer answers without being called on. She says, science is literally the joy of my life. I am literally embracing it right now. Michaela Menzer is not literally embracing anything. She's just sitting at her desk, chat catty corner to mine, with her hands clasped in front of her, and her thick dark braid twisting over her shoulder. Michaela Menzer smells like sunscreen, which kind of makes the entire classroom smell like sunscreen. And the air in here is damp and hot. I wish Fountain Middle had air conditioning. I wish we had enough money to go to Valley Hope Middle, which does have AC. But now that mom's sick, dad says we need to tighten our belt a notch. And anyway, Twig's here, even though her family can definitely afford Valley Hope. So I guess this place isn't so bad. Mr. Neely is saying my name, but I haven't been listening. So I just nod at him and give him my best. I'm embracing science smile. Mr. Neely says, I'm glad you're having so much fun with the assignment. Making observations is supposed to be homework, Natalie. Please pay attention in class. I am paying attention. And Michaela Menzer still smells like sunscreen. Only the most brilliant observations you'll ever read. Imagine you're hearing a drum roll right now. Go on, imagine it. Twig, best friend in the entire galaxy, her words. Step two, question. What baffles you about the world? Find something that intrigues you and study it with all your heart. Don your detective cap and become your own private investigator. Or should I say your own scientific investigator? Hashtag seventh grade sleuths. September 8th, assignment two questioning. Mr. Neely had us go around and read our scientific questions out loud today. So Tom K said, what's the maximum voltage before a battery explode, implodes? And Michaela Menzner said, how will plants grow if raised in different light conditions? I hadn't done the homework. And by the time he got to me, I still hadn't thought of a question. So I blurted, why does Mr. Neely use so many hashtags? My cheeks got hot right away and my palms started to itch because I'd never insulted a teacher like that. But Twig busted out laughing and gave me a thumbs up from across the room. Michaela rolled her eyes and flipped her hair braid, her, her braid from one shoulder to the other. Nobody else knew how to react, and they basically looked at each other like, is she serious or joking? Mr. Neely smiled, 
because for all that energy of his, apparently he's pretty patient. I felt the knots in my stomach untangle. That question doesn't quite prompt scientific investigation. Keep searching the wor world around you for a valid question. To be honest, it was kind of embarrassing because I hadn't expected everyone else to take the assignment seriously. And it didn't help that Dari, new kid slash class genius, read his question right after mine and said some annoyingly smart stuff about acute angles or whatever. So now I have to come up with a new question and I'm not sure what to ask. In other news, mom didn't come out of her room for dinner again, which was extra bad tonight because dad went to all this trouble making it. When I came home from school, he was hovering over some fat old cookbook, trying to stuff herbs into a chicken and the water in a pot of pasta started bubbling over the edge. I stood there staring, not sure whether this was funny or sad until dad yelped, Natalie, stop standing there and help me. So that was what dad and I did for the next, for the next hour, him cooking and me measuring ingredients. And it was nice. We didn't even need to talk. Dad's a therapist. So whenever we do talk, he asks me a bunch of questions and says things like, and how are you feeling? To which I always answer annoyed. Anyway, the whole kitchen smelled wonderful and the chicken tasted surprisingly good. But when dad and I set the table for dinner, mom didn't even come out of her bedroom. Should I go get her, I asked. Dad gave me the sad smile and said, I think she needs space right now, which seemed to be his answer for everything mom related these days. But don't, think, don't you think she should be here? I would like that, but we need to give your mother some space. But dad, but Natalie, we ate the rest of dinner in silence. Only this time, it was the bad kind of silence and the food stopped tasting so good. Later, I tried to think of a scientific question for Mr. Neely, but I just kept thinking over and over, like an annoying song stuck in my head. Mom would have helped me with this. Whenever I had science or math questions for school in the past, we'd sit down at the dining, ta the dining table and spread all my worksheets and equations and diagrams out in front of us. She'd twist up her strawberry blonde hair and clip it back because for mom, that meant business. And we'd get to work. She'd think of an experiment for everything and anything. You didn't get chemical reactions? Well, inflate a balloon using baking soda and vinegar. Can't figure out water density? No problem, let's build a lava lamp. It didn't matter that I was bad at science. Not when I had mom to help me. Our kitchen would end up looking like a war zone and dad would walk in and act all mad like. I won't be cleaning this up this time, even though we all know he would. He always did. But now mom's in the bedroom and dad's cleaning the kitchen and it won't take him long. I think he even misses her mess. Now I'm sitting alone, realizing I can't think of the experiment that will explain everything. How can I get the answer when I don't even know the question? Michaela Menzer, cheating a cheater, because I know for a fact she's done that experiment before. Michaela's obsessed with her braids and knows how to do all different styles. I used to let her braid my hair, but not anymore. September 13th, assignment three, frogs. Mr. Neely sprang a doozy on us today. Guess what class? His eyes were big behind his black framed glasses and his bald head glinted under the fluorescent classroom lights. Nobody responded. Guess what? He repeated. Only this time he didn't wait for a response. We're doing dissections today. Hashtag frog dissections. Everybody started whispering at once. This was only our second week of school and most teachers don't hand knives out before they've learned their students' last names, even if they're only tiny frog cutting knives. But Mr. Neely grinned and passed out a list of safety instructions. We've been lucky enough to receive an unexpected opportunity. And like true scientific explorers, we will make the best of it, he said, which, knowing Fountain Middle, was probably code for. The school messed up and ordered a whole bunch of dead frogs way too early. Mr. Neely kept talking. We're going to open these frogs and see what makes them tick. You never truly know how an organism works until you see what's going on inside. We all kind of grimaced because gross. Michaela raised her hand and spoke before being called on. Again, Mr. Neely, you know how much I love science, but I literally can't do it. It's against human rights. Mr. Neely frowned. Well, I suppose I can't force you, Michaela, but if you feel this is against animal rights, you can sit in the hallway behind lockers and fill out a worksheet. Janie, Michaela's best friend, raised her hand and explained that she, too, believed in animal rights and must be removed from the experiment. Mr. Neely sighed. Anybody else? Personally, I am more comfortable with plants than dead animals, but considering the choice had become dissecting a frog or hanging out with Michaela and Janie, I chose the less vile option. It's not like I hate Michaela, not really. It's more that there's this black cloud of awkward whenever we're together, and everything feels all wrong. 
Sometimes, I don't know where the old Michaela went, the one who made magic potions with me while our moms worked together, the one who dug up dirt and helped me pack it into test tubes. I used to think that someone else replaced her overnight with a not Michaela, who was not my best friend, but now I try not to think about her at all. Mr. Neely sped through a two-minute lesson on what we're actually supposed to be learning from this whole dissection business, but none of us were listening. We were too busy scanning the room and silently making important partner arrangements for our first lab of the school year. Twig and I looked at each other immediately. She didn't actually need to ask, since of course we were going to work together. But she made an exaggerated you-me gesture, and I grinned and nodded back. As soon as Mr. Neely finished explaining safety precautions, we both hurried over to claim the lab table in the far back. It's in a corner that Mr. Neely can't really see, so it's obviously the best. Twig was moving at double speed. By the time I pulled out my notebook, she'd already organized our materials. Our materials being, you know, the dead frog and such. She tied her blonde hair back haphazardly, so random strands hung loose from the ponytail. I'm so excited about this, Natalie. Can you believe it? Can I cut first? I want to see the heart and maybe the bladder. Frog pee? Gross or cool? Twig was talking fast in her usual way, excited about things nobody should be excited about. You can cut the whole time, I said, as if I were making a grand sacrifice. Twig squealed. It'll be like operation. That's the thing about Twig. She's obsessed with games. Not video games like most people, but those old board games nobody actually likes to play. Although to be fair, she makes me play those games a lot. And I actually do enjoy them. Twig has a way of making things fun. And I hate to admit it, but I started getting into the dissection too. I wasn't cutting the frog open or anything, but I started narrating as Twig sliced. Like Twig was one of those doctors on TV. I even made the little heart monitor beeping sound. Then Twig leaned in close to the frog's stomach and shouted, Holy cow! Holy cow! I looked over her shoulder to see she cut open the stomach and found a grasshopper in there, totally intact. Stomach grasshoppers. Decidedly cool. Mr. Neely came over to see what was going on, and he got excited too. Class, look at what these scientific explorers found, he said. And then the whole class was crowding over us and saying, So cool! And, oh, gross! Even genius Dari came over to look, and I could tell he was upset that his frog hadn't had a nice dinner before dying. Dari bent over our lab table for a better look at the frog. His arms were stiff at his side as he fidgeted with the bottom of his t-shirt. Finally, he gave us a reluctant, well done, before walking back to his own table. Twig stuck her tongue out at him behind his back. Only, it's too bad because Mr. Neely noticed, and we were no longer star pupils. Materials, one scalpel, sharp. One pair of tweezers, metal. Two pairs of gloves, rubber. One frog, dead. Procedure, let Twig do the work. Two, let Twig discover dead grasshopper. Three, collect bragging rights. After school, Twig invited me back to her house, which we figured we could get away with under the pretense of doing our frog lab reports. I dialed Dad, and Twig leaned over. Tell young Jin I said hello. She shouted into my ear, and the receiver. I waved her off. Dad sounded tired when he answered, and when I asked to go to Twig's, he got all concerned sounding. Hanging out with Twig after school had never been a problem before, but since this summer, things have been different. Natalie, I think it would be best if you came right home. I don't want you running away from this situation. Dad's always calling Mom a situation and making a bigger deal about things than they really need to be. And he thinks the situation is really bothering me. And it is, I guess. But it's not like she's really sick, even though that's how Dad keeps referring to her. The way I see it, she just got bored with life, bored with us. I'm not going to waste my time being sad about it. It's not like I'm sneaking out in the middle of the night to go run away from home. I just want to go to Twig's for a couple of hours. He sighed. Natalie, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I know this has been really hard on you, but please understand. Dad, I interrupted. I'm hearing what you're saying, but this is for school. I really need to finish my lab report with Twig. He was silent for a beat, and I could picture him running his left hand flat down his side of his face, debating. He used to do that when he thought about his research and his clients. Now he does it when he thinks about mom and me. In the end, his fatigue won over his desire to therapist me. Please be home for dinner. And then, simple as that, we were free to escape to Twig's place. It's only a 15-minute bike ride from school. 10 if we're biking fast. And we rode fast today, trying to maximize our time together before Dad made me go home. Twig and her mom live in this mansion of a house. Twig's dad is a banker in New York and makes buckets of money. Her parents are amicably separated, but he sends these huge checks once a month. And Twig's mom makes a lot of money too, designing apps that tell pretty people what clothes they should wear. Twig's mom is beautiful. 
and used to be a supermodel. So she's basically obsessed with pretty clothes and pretty people. And they fly to Paris three times a year. Every time we pull up to her house on our bikes, I'm like, whoa. We'll be biking along this tiny road covered in trees, and then out of nowhere, their giant brick house will appear. Twig doesn't talk much about her parents, and she never brings anyone else to her house, which I guess isn't much of a problem because she doesn't have any close friends besides me. Here's the thing. Twig showed up in the middle of fourth grade. Like one day, she kind of poofed in from diff a different universe. She wore an outfit entirely made of sequins to celebrate her first day and appeared as we all stood outside the classroom waiting for school to start. Twig wore these plastic-heeled shoes that clacked when she walked, and everybody hushed and stared like we were in a movie. She laser-beamed over to Michaela and me and said, we're going to be friends. Michaela made this weird, wrinkly look I had never seen before and said, uh, but I smiled and said, awesome. Not everyone gets Twig, but I do. Anyway, Twig and I rode in through the big gate to her house and tossed our bikes in the lawn. As soon as we walked inside, her housekeeper, Helena, started fluttering around us. Helena's from France, and she speaks with this fancy accent that Twig and I try to copy when she's not around. We don't do it in a mean way, though. We really, we both really like Helena. Natalie, it's good to see my second favorite girl, she said as she took our backpacks and hung them on the coat rack. Thanks, Helena, I said. She poured us two tall glasses of cold milk, and Twig and I made our way down to the basement. What should we play? Twig asked as she flicked on the basement lights, illuminating our favorite hangout spot for the past few years. Two huge beanbags rested atop the hot pink shag rug that Twig's mom hates, but we love. Twig walked over to the far wall and put a hand on her hip as she examined her huge bookshelf filled, with an, filled entirely with board games. We could play Sorry or Parcheesi or Clue, she continued, but Twig only ever asks to seem polite. She always ends up picking the game herself. I don't care, I said, taking a sip of the milk and settling into the purple bean bag. By that point, Twig had already pulled Clue out of her stack of 100 billion board games and sat it in front of me. She flopped onto the green bean, the green bag and we set up the game, laying all the pieces out on the rug. We had this down to a science, and within a minute, Clue was ready. We played twice. The second time, we got Mrs. White with the candlestick in the kitchen, and the first time, I don't remember. When Twig started resetting the pieces for the third game, I suggested we actually write our lab reports. She agreed reluctantly, then doodled all over the cover of her composition books. Doodles are an important part of the process, Twig said, as she drew a row of cartwheeling frogs across the name line. To be honest, I don't think I've ever seen her do homework, even though I know she's smart. School is not really something that concerns her, and she definitely doesn't care about this assignment. But I spent an hour doing mine, and writing all this because, I guess, for some reason, I kind of do. Scalpels, for the record. Young Jin, Dad's Korean name, which Twig found on his diploma in his office. He goes by John, but Twig refuses to call him anything else. And I think Twig scares Dad, so he doesn't argue. Actually, Twig's mom is the one who named her. After some famous old supermodel, everybody, everyone assumes Twig is a funny nickname because she's long and skinny and her ash blonde hair sticks out everywhere, but it's actually short for Twiggy. Twig's embarrassed about her name, so she doesn't bother correcting anyone. Helena's obsessed with milk. Every time I come over, the first thing she does is ask if I want milk. I don't even like milk, but I always end up drinking it at Twig's house because Helena insists, the bones must grow, the bones must grow, and it's impossible to resist.